They Clone Tyrone is one of the weirdest films I've seen in a long time and has the best fried chicken ad since Jones Barbecue. Why not let one of my foot specialists or myself perform my magic? Look at that, don't they look wonderful? In this completely absurd film about the government controlling us through fried chicken and grape drink is a blistering commentary on society, racism, and of course the dangers of cloning. Hey, I'm not the clone, you're the clone. In this video we'll be taking a deep dive into the ending, the government's plan to assimilate, and the introduction of Tyrone. Tyrone. So grab a drumstick and relax, because here we go. Meet Fontaine, a down-and-out drug dealer struggling to survive in the cutthroat world of the Glen. It's never mentioned where exactly the Glen is, the license plates merely state that it's a swell place, ironic since it couldn't be further from. But the question of where they are is also followed by when they are. You have things like flip phones, CDs, and a beeper emporium suggesting we could be in the early 2000s, yet characters will talk about more recent events like Obama as president or blockchain setting it closer to present day. I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. This is all part of the absurd aesthetic of the film, which I thought was almost as refreshing as a delicious Suma soda. Speaking of which, the film's first image is that of a white man's eyes watching over a group of black men, foreshadowing how the white controlled surveillance state keeps a constant watch over the predominantly black neighborhood of the Glen. When Fontaine finds out one of his dealers, a pimp by the name of Slick Charles is late on his payments, he pays him a visit. Now Slick Charles says that the latest batch he got just ain't hitting right, and if you know the big twist of the movie, you'll understand why. More on that in a bit. The life of a drug dealer ain't easy in the Glen, and Fontaine is gunned down by rival dealer Isaac. But surprisingly, Fontaine wakes up good as new the next day. Now when I was first watching this movie, I thought we were dealing with a Groundhog Day type situation. Fontaine will wake up every morning, go through the paces, and try to figure out what's going on, but they clone Tyrone is a little different. Unlike Phil in Groundhog Day, Fontaine has no recollection of the events of the previous day, but goes through many of the same sequences of events like weight training and buying beer and scratch tickets at the convenience store. But things start to get strange for Fontaine as he sees a bloody man get picked up by an SUV with local homeless man by the name of Frog stating, Up to see the wizard again. In literature, frogs often symbolize ancient wisdom and knowledge. He may be a drunk homeless guy, but he seems to be the only person who knows what's going on in town. His reference to the Wizard of Oz is apt, considering Fontaine is still in our metaphorical Kansas, the Glen, but soon we'll find out that his world is being controlled by a seemingly all-powerful force with aspirations of total control. When Fontaine arrives yet again to ask for his money from Slick Charles, Charles can't believe he's alive. You should be breathing through some tubes right now. Charles saw him shot up just yesterday. How is he still here? This is where Woman of the Night Yo-Yo comes in. She recognized the car the perps who shot Fontaine and takes them to it, where Fontaine just so happens to see this same black SUV he saw outside the convenience store. So he does the only rational thing and breaks into the neighboring home. But to their surprise, it's completely empty. That is, of course, if you don't count the super weird break room with a TV playing Bloodsport in the background. Now, a creepy house like this wouldn't be complete without a secret elevator leading down to a Walter White lab facility. You're goddamn right. Here we find a substance that looks to be cocaine, but isn't quite. This is Compound H, a compound developed by the government and injected into various products like cocaine, fried chicken, hair cream, and grape drink to control the black population. As much of the film delves into Fontaine, Slick Charles, and Yo-Yo getting to the bottom of this mystery, just like a Nancy Drew novel, we don't get any answers until Fontaine devises a plan to rally alongside his rival drug dealer to take on the secret all-white scientists who live underneath the city experimenting on African Americans. But to understand how and why all of this has happened, we have to fast forward to the biggest twist of the film. The lead geneticist of this whole operation is none other than Fontaine himself, or should I say an older version. But why would he turn against his people? Why would he work with the very people who want to destroy his race? It all boils down to what happened to his little brother Ronnie. Earlier in the film we hear that Ronnie was killed by what's heavily implied is a white cop who left him to die on the pavement after being shot without calling an ambulance. Thus, Old Fontaine has this warped idea that by working with the government he'd be preventing injustices like this from happening through a process he calls assimilation. Assimilation is better 
than annihilation. He would rather assimilate his people rather than see them annihilated. Now the government wants to quote, win the race of the future, which we can see printed on the side of the golf carts underground, a cheeky play on words with race here having two meanings. Kiefer Sutherland's character, who is the main baddie of the film, says, And that's what we strive for. Keeping the United States united. But what he's really saying is keep the United States white. I also think it's ironic that his racist character is named Nixon and is played by a Canadian. Up until now, the project of creating controlled communities through drugs, music, and products was merely a band-aid solution to keep people of color contained. This process needed the use of specific clones, and it's important to note that not everyone in town is a clone, just key players instrumental in dealing out the products to keep these communities obedient. Whether it be Fontaine and Slick Charles through laced cocaine, a hairstylist through perm creams, or the reverend with his tainted blood of Christ. And do you know what he wants most out of each and every one of you? Obedience! And if you're not getting your dose of obedience through some delicious goddamn fried chicken, the government is continually experimenting on new methods, including music that can turn you from violent to peaceful. As I said, these are band-aid solutions for control, but Old Fontaine has found a permanent solution through something he calls genetic assimilation. It's not enough to think the same. We have to be the same. His work in genetics allowed him to separate 378 unique genes that separated himself from white people, Asians, and Latinos. Thus, through generations, he could slowly assimilate people of color into white people, hence the tubes of black to white human specimens in his office. We saw some early test versions of this with the Afro-donning lab tech and chicken shop manager. Fontaine stumbles upon his clone in the duplication chamber and finds its number is A001, suggesting he was the first clone, which would make sense if he's based off its creator. But there are other Fontaines, such as Nixon's driver slash bodyguard, Chester. Chester is super obedient, and Fontaine actually uses his code word Olympia Black, the same code Nixon used to control Fontaine, to shoot and kill his creator. The attack on the underground compound is a success, with all the clones set free. Fontaine even says he'll come to start a new life with Yo-Yo and Charles in Memphis. But just when it seems the story is done, Fontaine wakes up just like he did after he died back in his bed. But you'll start to notice some immediate differences, like the tattoos and haircut. We aren't in the Glen anymore. This looks like it could be Los Angeles. We get the big palm trees and LA Laker flags in his home. Like the Glen, however, is his daily routine, where we can see him weightlifting, going to the convenience store, and pouring the homeless man a drink. There's even a quick gang sign flashed by this kid suggesting he could be part of the Bloods or Crips. But it's when the news comes on that we see a clone of Fontaine on the screen. Now, we purposely do not know if this report is coming from the Glen. Just as the announcer is about to say where we are, a cough muffles the location. Even in the close captioning, we don't get to see where this is. Nixon did tell us that the government has experiments all around the country, including Los Angeles and Detroit. So either what we're seeing here is more of the Glen or another location that managed to escape. You may have even noticed some crunch cereal on the table here, the same cereal found in the Glen the government used to control its subjects. And the last line of the film is, ain't that you, Tyrone. So the Los Angeles version of Fontaine is Tyrone, hence why the film is called They Clone Tyrone. But now I want to hear what you thought of They Clone Tyrone. Give me your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... I'm not let one of my foot specialists or myself perform my magic. Look at that. Don't they look wonderful?